this is the moment I've been waiting for my whole life. This is Tanya Pearson interviewing Tanya Donnelly <laughs> on June 26, 2017, in my apartment in East Hampton, Mass., for the Women of Rock Oral History Project. Thank you so much, um, Tanya. Thank you, Tanya. That's so... I know, I love that. I never, that. yeah. I never I'm going to say it a lot it. because I never get to say yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Now that that's... Uh, now that that's over, <laughs> we just like talked so much before the interview actually started. <laughs> <I know. laughs> like, yeah, you can just more. stick that and just. Like, <laughs> yeah. I'll put it somewhere in the middle. Um, but like I said, when we were talking for four and a half hours before we started, um, this is a personal and professional biography. So we're going to. I know a little bit about your childhood and stuff mm-hmm. um, from interviewing Kristen, but if you could. Talk about your family of origin, where you grew up, um, your, like, nomadic kind of upbringing. Mm. So I was born in Newport, Rhode Island um, in 1966. The year was 1966. Um, And actually, initially, my parents were it was a teen pregnancy and there was no, you know, they were both activists and they were both very involved in the folk festival, but they were, other than that, there was kind of a tradition, they were trying to follow a very traditional sort of marriage model, I think, Mm -hmm. um, as extremely young people. Uh, And then I think really being so involved in the folk festival primarily, um, they were, you know, what they were, started to be exposed to, um, kind of opened, opened up their perspective, opened up their marriage. (laughs) Um, and we sort of became kind of a, uh, our, our apartment sort of became a place where people were coming in and out, um, coming in and out of, um, just sleep, you know, sort of just as a place to sleep, for one thing. Um, my parents kind of became very experimental in very many ways. Um, and, you know, this is something where I think they have a lot of guilt around this, but I hold no, I harbor no no resentment. They're wonderful people. There was always warmth and love. And so they tend to, I, I hesitate to talk about the impact that they had, that, you know, that they're, that the drug use, the, the, they embraced the sexual revolution in every way possible. Um, but I never felt unsafe. I never felt, you know, it was probably more than a child should be exposed to. And Kristen probably said the same, um, or similar. Yeah. Um, because our families actually sort of entered that, Maelstrom together, and that's sort of how we met initially, was um, in the context of what was happening in Newport at the time, Um, and then everyone's marriage just sort of exploded and people started marrying each other in an attempt to normalize again, in a way, and so my, and then during that my father married her mother, and that's when we became sisters um but we our friendship predates that that relationship in california for a while my parent when i was three my folks specifically my dad i should say decided that we needed to be in haight ashbury so sold of all this quit their jobs sold all their furniture um we lived in a in a um a land rover we drove across country and slept in the Land Rover and kind of uh, the kindness of strangers also was, was, a, was a beneficial. We slept on people's floors. We, people fed us. We, um, and then by the time we got to California, my mom was done. <laughs> um, so we actually only stayed, I, th- I want to say we were in San Francisco itself for maybe 
six months. Mm-hmm. And then, and it wasn't really what my dad was looking for. He, he was look, you know, they were both very politically active and that was, that, that had become very much a social, more of a social scene mm-hmm. and then a political scene, at least where they landed. Um, <clears throat> and so they once again picked up and at that point, I think that they came to this sort of peaceful agreement that they wouldn't go back home. We were not going to head back to Rhode Island, um, but we weren't going to stay in California. And so then it just sort of became this meandering trip home through the Southwest, through Mexico. Um, I don't remember, you know, all of my information is secondhand from them for the most part, and their stories are very different. Mm -hmm. So... um, I remember like weird moments. I remember animals a lot because of being a kid. That's what I sort of latched on to, like a coyote that yeah. we saw, or you know what I mean, like um, <laughs> the wolf. You know the what we heard at night when we were sleeping outside. Um, strays all over the country. Like that's yeah. I really latched on to, to that, um, and also my brother who was not even one. Um, oh, I was going to ask. Focused if you had on any. Him. Yeah. Um, siblings. Yes, by bi- uh, one younger biological, brother. Okay. younger brother, um, and by the time we got home, they I think that their very fundamental differences in nature had become stark, and um, that's they sort of started to to drift part of that time, and they were divorced by the time I was seven. Um, which is also when I felt when I met Kristen. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, our families became, Newport is very small and, um, our families became close and then that sort of segued into a relationship between, between our parents. Um, my mom went back to, to school and sort of wanted to, you know, really, she, her, our life became much more structured after she went through a very, very brief but chaotic disco phase (laughs) where she really embraced, she really went, it was, she was out and about and very much, that was the music in our house going from, you know, Joni Mitchell and Laura Nero and Sandy Denny and all of a sudden it was, you know, full disco in the house. Um, (laughs) Which was fun. I mean, you know, but she sort of, that, that was her, that was kind of how she cleansed her palate, I think, in a way, between like her nomadic yeah. hippie life and her yeah. stationed um, life. And she went back to secretarial school, became a legal secretary. She did that at night while she worked all day. Um, and my dad married Kristen's mom, and so they, they kind of la- landed... Um, not permanently, they, those marriages, that marriage ended as well. And it was all, here, here's, the, here's the thing. I think we both, Kristen and I both, and our siblings, stepped back in a way um, and became like these little sociologists around it in a way. Um, like, hmm, that's interesting. Yes, I think so too. And like, you know, what are they up to now? And what does this mean? And where is this going? And... Um, and again, endless love always coming from the adults in our lives, in their way. Um, support for us in all our endeavors. Um, genuine interest in what we were doing. Um, but almost like on a peer level in some way, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going... Is this more than you wanted? <laughs> no, this is great. Um, but I think, anyway, f- the foundation that that laid of this sort of um, survivable chaos sort of gave us um, both the vulnerability and the strength to do what we ended up doing because there was this feeling of anything we do that's going to be scary is still going to be we're still fundamentally and we had each other Mm -hmm. um uh that 
uh, any risk. It just felt at the time like that risks were, uh, um, I think, you know, it's just, I don't know. Sorry. Let me to figure out a way to put this. Yeah. That, um, you know, over the years, so many times people say, you know, it's just so brave that at 15 you started doing what you were doing, but compared to what we were coming from, <laughs> you know, it felt extremely measured and extremely um, safe and well thought out and logical and sensible and we can do this thing so that's what we're going to do and everything's going to be fine because, you know, we had the wind at our back at that point. Mm. Um, so it, it, I remember early on when we were teenagers and people asking that question, we both would just for a second look at each other like, we have to make something up because we don't have an answer <laughs> to this. You know, there's no, uh, you know, and I think that that continues to, to this day with, at the age of 50, you know, we're 50 now and we have a lot of hind, hindsight and, uh, and I can say now that, that I see how everything lined up and how, um, this sort of latent fear kind of bolstered it, lifted us up in in a way that at the time because it didn't feel like fear mm-hmm. um now I can now I can look back and say oh we were scared to death but we just didn't feel it because we had never you know questioned that you know had never been taught to question um being nervous it didn't yeah me yeah it's just it was just nerves were part of everything um and so in some ways I mean you you know we do have that cha- that chaotic uh, beginning years and again I can't stress it enough with adults who still support it. Do you know what I mean? Like, there, I think, I, I know a lot of people who had very similar childhoods to ours who didn't have that same piece, mm-hmm. that essential, essential piece of um, still having the attention that was necessary in spite of yeah. this crazy, you know, domestic life. Um, and I think, you, you know the combination of that has it kind of is what sort of led to everything I've done since and and that she has since um so I don't know if that oh no that's that's a lot I don't even have to like ask a million little questions to yeah it's always funny talking about I've never really heard any of that before I mean like you know, I'm prepper- I mostly just, like, watch videos and, like, performances because I don't, I don't want to read too much. Right. But I read a lot of old interviews just yeah. because now this is, like, so many years later and, like, right. perspectives change. But I had never read anything where, like, you've talked in that amount of detail about... I, I, I didn't pre- really in the, blame, like, the blame culture. Yeah. Um, and I'm very protective of my past. Yes, yeah. Very. Um, because they are such good people Mm -hmm. and because they were so young and, um, and so (laughs) there is no, you know, which is why I hesitate to, because I don't want anything to sound. I don't think any of that sounded like blame. I don't know. I, I, I talk the same way and I'm always like very careful. Yeah. And when you mentioned that they were young, I was just like, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Disco, young. Right. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I have sense. a child now who was my mother's age when I was one. You know, so that's like, um, yeah. You know, that's nuts. Yeah. And then you can really see. Yes. It. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And from that perspective, I'm like, man, she did a nice job. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know. Um. So. <laughs> okay. So one question that I have. Any interview that I've read about you, people's opinions about you are all the same. And that's that you're kind, well, and like just really well adjusted 
and nothing is, <laughs> nothing really bothers you. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so, I mean, I was digging. I'm like, she's a cancer. Yeah. Like, there's got to be, no one can be that nice. But is it, I mean, do you, number one, is that true? Or are you totally different behind closed doors? And number two, well, is it because I mean, of what you just mentioned? Like, your upbringing and the chaos, and so nothing is really a I, big deal. I mean, my, my closest relationships are predictably the more difficult ones, you know, like yeah. everybody in life, you know, the, so, I mean, I drive Dean crazy and I'm very unpleasant at home sometimes the way anybody, you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah. Like we, that, but it's like, but, um, I think I just, I don't know. Um, and you know, I have friendships that are, mm-hmm. you know, I, I don't know. I don't want to say at the risk. I I really find myself in situations with people that I genuinely enjoy, Mm -hmm. and that I genuinely end up loving a lot of the time. that's just a happy fact of my, I mean, I don't know what you know. And, and when, and so a lot of those people are the people that are talk that are quoted. Oh, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, you're going to hear from most of the people quoted in those situations are people who, who I love and who love me and who, you know, that's true. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's to going to be positive, like positive <laughs> feedback. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I definitely, there is a part, you know, I had, there, there, there's, there was a, there's a trajectory that can be followed that started with, I was the peacemaker in my family, uh, very much so, um, uh, between my siblings and the adults, between, you know, the adults and themselves, I absolutely fell into a role of you know, the calmative okay. piece a little bit. And also, and, and so because that was successful f- through most of my childhood and young adulthood, I did go through a period of, of course, bulking against, you know, just feeling like, okay, that's not what I'm doing anymore. And so I started experimenting with, you know, selfishness and you know I choose me and or you know just this kind of like like how am I going to balance the scales of my servitude but then then it just started to feel so false and so ridiculous to me that I would be that you know directed I'm like okay this is what I'm doing and and it just it didn't work and so you know I kind at this point I just sort of feel like it doesn't exhaust me to 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 be that person. If it did, um, it would be a different story. Mm-hmm. But it's not sucking my essence or hurting me in any in any way. Um, and I definitely am not a pushover in 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 any way. Any of my friends will tell you, like that the Irish comes up, <laughs> like oh here comes the Irish is what my dean says. <laughs> like that gets rid. You know I have. I, um, I have my own combative style <laughs> when, I, when I need to, but in general, I just don't, um, it's not a path of least resistance. It's more just sort of, um, an, you know, peace mm. that I'm looking for. And it's more... I find it easier to attain when I'm just being that person. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I don't yeah. and I don't get anything out of you know, unnecessary confrontation. I don't benefit, you know, I don't come away with anything mm. that that positively adds to my life, so I don't Why look do for I? it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, oh my God, where 
should I go next? I'm already lost. <laughs> I like four questions in. Um, well, okay. So I'm going to ask some of the... Some, like, music questions. Sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, we should talk about... We should talk about music. Yeah, let's talk about music. <laughs> um, but, okay, so you said that you were, friend, you were friends with Kristen mm-hmm. before... Then your parents married. Mm-hmm. Um, you're always very close, and you have this like kind of kindred spirit. Mm-hmm. Like that, I think it's really yeah. cool that you came from these kind of similar backgrounds, and then ended up being family. Yeah, and could kind of you have uh, like a little mm-hmm. built-in support system. Yeah. Um, Although I will say we were initially quite resistant to that union, and oh. it, it just I felt we felt like it was encroaching on our thing when they started dating. Or dating is not what happens in Rhode Island. <laughs> but um, it, when they started hanging out, we both sort of felt like, wait a minute, this is our relationship, not yeah. yours. And, you know, there were just logistical difficulties. Like, suddenly I'm sleeping in her room. Not for sleepovers, but because it's my room too now. And that was, oh, you know, yeah, that, that there were that that kind of, those that new sort of topography of our relationship was really hard for us to navigate for for a while mm-hmm. um so it's funny because we at we embraced the sister brand <laughs> a little bit late mm-hmm. it was i uh, actually kind of well into i want to say like our late teens before we even started using that word oh i mean we would say stepsister occasionally okay. um but i think once we kind of came back together once the band started touring and we were alone again together that's when i you know i think it really did start to feel like you are my sister yeah. <laughs> and you always have been and you know so that felt less like something that had been imposed on us mm-hmm. and more like our choice again yeah so um when did you both start Playing music to get... I know both of your fathers, like, gave you guitars. I think I read that it's, it, it, Backwards, though. Order. Like, Jim, her dad gave me a guitar, and my dad gave her one. Oh. <laughs> and, and for some... I, I don't know how it worked out that way, but we ended up with each other's father's guitars. Um, <clears throat> but, yeah, they were both... They both played, and they both... You know, my dad was, like, most, mainly just singing Dylan songs around the house. <laughs> um, her dad wrote his own songs and so that's kind of that was sort of like our camp our like right songwriting camp was going to his house and playing his songs with him and then learning Beatles songs and Dylan songs and um and and then sort of writing our own stuff almost immediately on the back of that um so you like you were exposed to music at an early age. Like your parents listened to music and mm. um, you know, went to San yeah. Francisco. Um, who were your? I mean, were you like? Because this is what I always. And I'm not sure how to phrase this, but you started a band at like a really young age. Mm-hmm. Did was music something? I mean, and having interviewed Kristen. Um, you know, who, like, her kind of reasons for playing is, like, she she's like, I have yeah. to, or mm-hmm. this happens to me. Um, and that or, is, did you have that, that is same, a fact. <laughs> yeah. But did you, was your interest in music at that age, uh, did you feel like it was a calling, or was it just something that, that you enjoyed kind of, like, doing every I, now and I then? didn't feel mm-hmm. like it. I mean, I didn't have that same... And, you know, there are times when I feel, where I question, would I have done it without her? You Mm -hmm. know, I always wanted to, I always, I was constantly singing and playing something throughout my childhood, but never with the urgency that she felt and feels to this day. Um, That came later for me, and now that's very much a part of, you know, an intractable part of who I am. Um, But then... I was, my heroes were 
Diane Fossey and Jane Goodall and the leakies and like I wanted to be Do you say Jane Goodall? Yeah. Oh really? Like I wanted to be you know, you talked about being alone in the forest. I wanted to be alone in the forest surrounded by some breed of animal. Like that was my that's you know I talked about that very early on my interest in anthropology when I was a teenager and we were first doing music. It came up a lot in Boston interviews and then I sort of dropped that narrative because I was like all right that is a 16 year old girl's <laughs> you know that was my sort of it's like you know I love Amelia Earhart so I want to fly a plane like that was sort of that <laughs> same you know who knows if that's what I would have pursued but at the time that was my main mm-hmm. interest um and so I think I had it in my head like we got signed in high school you know at the end of high school so we're gonna go tour but then after that I'm gonna come home and I'm gonna go to school and um, and that never happened. That was never an option for Kristen. Okay. And there was a point when I remember with Dave and I in on I think our second European tour, just being like, I think we're probably not going to go back to school, are we? <laughs> or just like this is seems like this is what's going to happen from this point on. Um, and fortunately, that's what did did happen but you know I've called Kristen my musical midwife in the past and I think that that it's hard for me to know because I mean I I would like to think that this thing that has become such a so deeply woven into who I am I would have found that anyway and that would have been what I um was led to but I genuinely don't know Mm -hmm. um because she was just uh, you know, we're doing this, we're going here, we have this show, we get it, da, da, da. You're, you have to cancel your, you know, it just, you know, it's so funny because now she's so not that person. Yeah. Um, but back then she was bossy about, I mean, just like, here's where we're going, this is what we're doing, you do this, like delegating, um, here's the new song, you, you know, just very, very amazingly for, you know, at the time, I just took it for granted, but now I look back, I'm like, what an amazing kid she was. Mm. She was just how, not just driven, because there are a lot of driven young people, but managerial and a great leader. And um, these are things that she does not, she would never self-describe this way now. And I think they are maybe qualities that have fallen a little bit to the aft. Mm. Um... But back then she was like, yeah, none of that came up. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's like it, I know, and it's a piece that I think is missing in her narrative because yeah. it's well, been it's downplayed. It. Yeah, <laughs> you also just I felt just felt bad for my own sister for a minute because she used to say that about me. I was always like writing songs, and she like you would wake me up at six o'clock in the morning and like put an instrument in my hand. Yeah, and be like you're playing this part. This is what we're doing. Like, oh, yeah. then we're going to put a show yeah. on it. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. Sending out invitations. Yeah, yeah she was, like, like printing out flyers. And, <laughs> yeah. and, like, you know, like, today we're going to, like, illuminate the borders of our, <laughs> of our the EP that I just pressed. Like, you know, like. <laughs> yep. Okay. I identified with that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Then I was like, okay. <laughs> um. How did you, okay, so you said that your parents were always really supportive of all of your, like, artistic pursuits and endeavors. Um, how did you make it through school what, while you were High school, you mean? Band? Yeah. Because, um, you, like, you started throwing music, were you 12 or 13, or were you older? We were f- 14 when we started. Like, actually? Right, play, actually, okay. actually writing and calling it a band. Okay. And, like, yeah. Um... Were they like worried? I mean, was anyone no. worried they weren't? We had no su- or... no. I mean, okay. we had no pressure. I was gonna say we had no supervision. <laughs> Let's call it pressure. We had no pre- We had no real external pressure to do well in school. But Kristen and I were good students. Mm-hmm. From we had always been, you know, good at school, and so I think. We kind of rode that to the end and just felt like, you know, I've always just 
you know, the, I think because we weren't pressured, but we were praised for it. And so it, we, you know, the feeling of losing that as part of our, who mm -hmm. we were, because we did sort of, you know, like, I'm a good student. That's who I am. You know, yeah. I do well in school. I'm in the accelerated program. I did, you know, we sort of, there was no question that we were going to ever drop out of school. Um, college was different. Like none of us felt, <laughs> Kristen would go to, to Salve Regina in Newport when we were home and off tour. Um, and Dave went to PC kind of in the same way, you know, but yeah. we didn't have that same, that didn't extend into college, interestingly. Because it should have in a way, but it just didn't. I think because we were signed to 4AD by then, and we um, were really invested in the music, and we were touring, and you know, already had our eye on Boston, where we were doing, getting really good shows at that point, and you know, opening for Mission for you know, just playing with people that it's Elm 66, and just you know, that whole. We were already feeling the pull, the draw of that, so that pulled away from the academic um, piece mm -hmm. for me, most radically, I think, because I just moved to Boston and didn't look back and didn't really. Um, after I was like twenty one, I never thought to go back, and I kind of wish I had, oh. had you There's know, still time. in a way. Well, I know, you can anytime. I know, yeah, I know. That's what's great. Yeah, <laughs> I know. And I do think about that. And I do audit things. I do audit classes that I'm interested in sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't, yeah, I know. It just feels very... Um, yeah. It's yeah. scary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, there's not everyone I know that's gotten on the, off the... That I know at your age that went back when I was your, you know, back yeah. then, is so happy they did. And I do have a piece where I feel like, oh, I should have done that. Because it's, I mean, there's no one that regrets skills, it that I know. You know, yeah. like, what else am I going <laughs> to, what else am I going to do? Yeah, but also yeah. just for your own. Oh, yeah, no, I, mean, I yeah. was never a good student or, I mean, I did, ter I like barely graduated high school, you know. I was just like a mess for so long mm -hmm. and just not, I mean, no, just a different person now I enjoy it I like being there and yeah it's like oh I didn't know right. that I could be a good student yeah <laughs> I yeah. just have to like want well to do it's it. also yeah and that's yeah. part right that's yeah big part of it yeah. again back to the math this did not apply mm -hmm. to the math situation for me <laughs> as much <laughs> still hate math <laughs> still sucks <Yes. laughs> um oh and okay so uh, all right, what is my question? So at that time, like, throwing muses were, like, pretty, like, really successful, successful in the, you know, yeah, underground, yeah. like, indie, and I, I kind of use that word as a blanket term, but it means right. different things with different scenes at yeah, yeah. different times, it but does. you were very successful really early on. Yeah. Um, so when that happened, did your... And you said that you, like, didn't finish college and that was it. Um, like, had your expectations for your future kind of shifted to, I'm probably, I'm going to do music as, like, a job. This is my life now. Yes. This is it. Yes. Okay. So that, yeah. all right. And at that point, you know, and I think it was really, that became, I mean, by the time I was 21, I was... Mm -hmm pretty com fully com fully committed to to staying on course um and then you know meeting Kim and starting to work with her also really cemented I think having something my extracurricular yeah. relationship with Kim while I was still in the muses really made me feel like oh this is um this is something that actually I can do separate from the framework of throwing muses and it is who I am and I can, can you know um the breeders really in a way and this is all hindsight because I don't know that I would have said this at the time but that really made me feel like oh I'm a musician now because you were like the, yeah like I'm the guitarist the lead the lead yeah, guitarist with, in that 
with the muses, and, yeah, yeah, and the breeders both. But like that with Kim, it was sort of like it, it, the freedom that came of doing something with someone else. It really did sort of make me f- understand that mm-hmm. that I was, you know, an artist in my own skin, uh, you know, and not just in terms of yeah no, playing with her, with with Kristen. So yeah, yeah. Huh. No, I'm just, yeah, I just thought about that recently, too. Like, it's kind yeah. of validating when someone that that you don't know or someone kind of outside your peer group asks you to, um, I don't know, make music or, like, yeah. do something creative. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it firms something up, I think, in, in, in you. Hmm. Well, I guess I do want to know... Because you were so young, and this might be a boring kind of question, but like, but what was it like to, uh, to tour as kind of a young person, especially like before you were twenty one? Yeah. Um, what were your what were the like band dynamics like? Because I'm sure you were just, you were figuring stuff out. Or, yeah. And you were kind of like, you weren't in the front at that time. You were both front people, and you. You know, you no, sound like I, lead on some songs, but you were definitely more of Yeah, a, which is all, at that point, I was yeah. interested in. Um, you know, we carried our little bubble around with us because we all, we grew up together and we had, we brought people that we knew on tour with us. You know, we made sure, we, very, we were very unintentionally self-protective mm-hmm. in that way. Um, so... So it was, you know, traveling in a pack. Um, and we brought our dynamic that we'd always had with us, like our, our humor and the way that we, you know, interacted with each other just sort of set the tone for every tour and recording situation. And um, it was very much a band. And, and I think the familial piece, the fact that Kristen and I... We're sisters, and every band I've ever been in has included siblings. Oh, I think not coincidentally. If I'm gonna, oh yeah, you know, I've never uh, every band situation has had a sibling element to it, um, because I like that. You know, I, 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 it's a two sided thing. There's a real like goofy immaturity that comes with that dynamic, which is nice because it diffuses any issue you know any unpleasantness that comes up that's a uh that's an easy way to get a handle on negativity is to go to that silly sillier place Mm -hmm. (laughs) um and the place of humor and 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 of a of a shared language um and so you know we sort of in some ways it kept us very young in good ways and bad. Um, but it also really was a smart way to, to proceed into the world. Mm-hmm. Um, it was lucky, you know. Yeah. I do want to ask one question because um, this is from uh, when I interviewed Kristen, she brought this up. And I didn't think of you guys as, like, uh, I just didn't think about this happening to you, because you're, like, an indie band. Um, You were signed to 4AD, which Mm -hmm. was, like, a big label, but it's not a major label or anything. Yeah. Um, But she said that she felt, like, the weird one, and that you were the cute one. Well, that happened, and, you know, that was something that, that... I was you like, know, I never. <laughs> yeah, I, never at you that I, well, way. I mean, it was insulting to both of us. Yeah, you know. But was that something that and I mean, people like called you that, or when you'd be interviewed? Well, or, I don't know if it was totally if it was like her um, insecurities at that time or something, or if it was something. I think that there's you a also little piece felt. of that. Yeah, because she does. Uh, anyway, that's uh, there is a piece to to, to yeah. that. Um, <clears throat> We are much more alike than we are different, I will say. Mm-hmm. Um, which 
is something that isn't immediately evident, but which we have we always felt. And so when if people need to have like they do this all the time, they do it um, with with any with any microcosm, they will choose yeah. who's who and who serves what purpose. But very, very specifically with women, what woman is what type of woman. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially with sisters, that becomes even more interesting oh, to yes. do. <laughs> you know, who, who served what purpose yeah. and who provided, you know, who was, fell into what role. Um, we didn't, I don't think we ever absorbed that enough for it really to, you know, we always had the attitude of like, well, that's just lazy yeah. journalism specifically you know um but you know of course it of course it makes you self-conscious you know Mm -hmm. it would make us very self-conscious and maybe we made choices we wouldn't have otherwise made as a result of that non-stop running commentary on who we were um but you know it's just i mean you have we, I think we did understand that there were going to be inaccuracies as part of what happens when people are talking about you. Yeah. A lot of people are going to be inaccurate and make shit up. Mm-hmm. And so we had a pretty healthy perspective on that kind of out of the out of the gate. Yeah. Yeah. I mean I tend to be more uh, thick-skinned. I think if 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 there is going to be a difference about, you know, you know, she's so forthcoming, and she so really puts herself out there, and then is simultaneously quite easily hurt. Some, you know. Yeah. Um. Whereas I walk very firmly in the center of both of those things. Yeah. <laughs> so. I read one, I read an interview, I forget which one, it was some like, it was probably like a Rolling Stone article, but this was during Deli and Gail and, or I don't know, there was some other bandmate, but they were like, I've known her for this long and I've never even seen her apartment. <laughs> <laughs> Like, the most private person I know. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that was during that time, I think, coming out of, you know, I, I mean, I'm going to... Oh, yeah, after, like, yeah. muses and... Right. And honestly, watching, being on the, having a front row seat to the way Kristen's honesty was used against her so often, I think it, that there was, there was going into belly, I was like, not me. Mm-hmm. You know, like, I, you know... I will talk about the music. Yeah. That was my that was my MO for uh, for several years. Just mm-hmm. if you want to talk about music and then you know I would be drawn out on certain things. Um But yeah, I did sort of and you know again, I was sort of in a place where the more exposed I felt and the bigger the shows and the more interviews in my personal life, I was in my apartment alone because that's yeah. all you know I was ex- you know just drained mm-hmm. you know um, and I you know and it was hard you know I, I mean from going from the muses where I threw up before every single show and I'm not exaggerating because I was so nervous and n- trying to get out of interviews because I you know I basically sort of just sat next to her because she wanted someone else there a lot. Yeah. Um, but I didn't want to be, the, you know, uh, so with belly, when I, all of a sudden I'm a front person and things are going way better than expected, um, it was supposed to be a, you know, of something I was doing with hometown friends. <laughs> um, it just, I was just like, fuck, are you fucking kidding me? Now I have to talk about myself. All oh, this is what I have to do now. Um, I did sort of have this, again, with the very constructed, here's how I'm going to, here's who I'm going to be now, and I'm going to be 
extremely shut down. <laughs> and I'm going to talk about the music and I will, you know, repeat. But there were times and, you know, also I was <clears throat> drinking too much then. And so during interviews, I would say more than I wanted to. Yeah. And because it was like pub interviews and, yeah. you know. Um, and then my reaction to, to having re- revealed would be to really close ranks for a while and it was just like a a very difficult time in figuring out how I was going to handle any of that and I didn't handle it well and we fell apart as a result you know I mean for that and a number of reasons yeah but. um alright I'm gonna skip ahead but then we're gonna go back okay okay just because <laughs> that reminded me of um you, I just think it's really interesting how like people's perspectives change over time too. So, you might have said one thing, you know, twenty years ago yeah. or something, and oh, like, yeah, feel yeah. differently about Absolutely. it now. Absolutely. Um, but it doesn't seem like you were ever comfortable with the like the level of success that Belly achieved. Because I mean, that was just like a different level than. Throwing muses and breeders. Up to um, that point with the breeders, yeah. yeah. And then you're, like, Grammy-nominated. And, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's a different level with people, like, kind of watching you all the time. Um, do you feel, do you feel, like, proud of that, of those achievements with Belly now? And just how do you feel about success or that again like what yeah. is success but that kind of success how, how do you feel about that now versus how I how felt, about, felt that. about it then um it was you know again like just in terms of the duality of my reactions to things and my personality in general um I there was a huge part of me that had a very embraced it and we had so much fun and again we these are people I had known for a very long time, when I wanted to start it, to start the band, so okay, the Breeders, the star, Belly's first album, those songs were supposed to be a Breeders album. Oh. It was supposed to be the second Breeders album, and in fact, the demos from Fort Apache for those songs say Breeders on them. Oh no, kidding! Yeah, and Kim came in and did them a few of them with me when we were as we were getting them ready, and then, and then Kim. And at that point, she was going to leave the Pixies and I was going to leave the Breeders. It was like, <laughs> like an affair. But she stayed with them and I was anxious to move on. So I went back to Newport and I recruited friends there, musicians there. The Gorman Brothers, Tom and Chris, and then Fred Abong, who was in the Muses, came with me for that first one. And Gail later. And... Um, and so I did have that same sort of, you know, posse feeling to that band, but the fact that it was glaringly focused on on me, it didn't feel solo, but it felt like all of a sudden I was, even if we were all together, the spotlight was still on, on me. And it felt less like a band than any band I'd been in as a result. To, to me, even though it was 100% a, dem- a democratic situation, in terms of perception, I just felt like very... And, you know, it was at a time, too, when the focus on women and the onus to represent women, all yeah. women, being nice. one woman... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when every individual woman had to represent represent, yeah. <laughs> represent all women, and as a result, you know, there was a little bit of a cannibalism that happened, where women were kind of turning on each other in the press. Occasion, it wasn't the, you know, completely pervasive, but you know, yeah. there were some slings and arrows being thrown, and that leveled me. Um, I could handle 
almost everything else except that. Mm. That was the, I have to say, like, being, you know, challenged on my feminism and on who I, you know, my my strength and how I chose the choices that I made, that microscope coming from other women at the time just it was just so painful and and you know is it like a specific article i mean you don't have to say i'm just curious because i don't remember there were spe- it was a it was um yeah there was okay. there were spe- it was sort of a specific little battle and you know since then it's become now in hindsight i'm like oh that was just sort of more everybody carving space and trying to figure out you know how we were going to move you know it was it, it was almost like okay now there's and now there's there are these these voices now and we have to make sure that the voices are saying the right thing mm-hmm. to move the agenda forward yeah. um and that's i get that and i almost agree with it to a certain extent now not to the not in a way that i would ever <laughs> put out there to another woman but at the time, I was so just coming from a place of you write your songs, you play your songs, you tour, you're with your friends, you do, you know, the music was everything and the songs were everything and there were the, and everything else, I just felt like this very naive, I, you know, that speaks for itself. Yeah. I don't have to say anything else. I don't have to, you know, if I... Whatever else I do is peripheral to that. So it doesn't matter if I don't have pants on and a gap ad. Like, which now I would not make oh, that choice. Do you know what I mean? Bad. But stuff yeah. like that where I just felt like, are you kidding me? After everything yeah. that I've done and what I, you know, like, you know, I'm a music worker. But it, to be to to be questioned because I did one stupid or you know if some several stupid <laughs> or you know at the time, but you know I I just sort of feel like in defense of any woman who makes those choices like that's part of the journey and that's part of the you know I, it, it, everyone's just trying stuff on all the time and I feel like that is part of being human and that that shouldn't be questioned mm. and should not have been questioned as vociferously maybe as it was um and so really that was hard that was hard. anyway long-winded answer to a very simple question um i i navigated most things pretty pretty well and i figured out how to do interviews and i figured out how you know t- who to how to surround myself with you know we we figured out as a band how who needed to be around us and how you know um to keep us healthy and it still just felt like Newport on the road Mm -hmm. you know for the most part it wasn't we weren't you know we weren't surrounded by industry we weren't surrounded by voices other than our own for the most part um the hard thing was always press and always just sort of, you know, how a, from our perspective, a fun photo shoot turned into some kind of litmus test as to how, what we were saying. I'm like, I wasn't saying anything. I dressed up like Elvis. Who fucking cares? (laughs) Like, (laughs) it was just goofy. You, You know, like these like moments that, for us just felt light took on this weight that was insupportable so. do you think it was like partially the time period too because that was when like 90s women of rock I mean you, had t- yeah. you know Tracy was nominated for mm-hmm. it was like L7 mm-hmm. you got I mean yeah it was a good time in a lot of ways but I, f- I feel like it's just it's all like cyclical yeah and so it's kind of like when they're when there are like too many women 
then it's like media and press make it this really divisive. Um, yeah, kind of because they feel field. like they, because then it does like then they're picking who is going to represent the gender. Yeah. Um. Which immediately yes becomes divisive. We only get one. We only get like one yeah. or two. Oh, we had we I I sat in <laughs> meetings back then, sat where people would actually say, actually say this. Well, we have too many women on the radio right now. Oh, seriously? Yeah, to my face and my manager. Like, we're going we're gonna to hold this song back because there are too many women right now. Holy... And then listing. So-and-so's got a single, so-and-so, da 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 And I would just be like, what the... F- are you... You're at- I was so stunned by the interaction itself. <laughs> just that someone would say those words wow. to-, to me. Yeah. No it was. Ever I mean, I'm laughing, but it was. Yeah. The, no, it's no. Really it was. Disturbing. It's just like ridiculous. And I'm. And I'm going to guess that it's possibly not radically different now. Sometimes, mm. you know. Yeah. That really pisses me off. Yeah, it really pisses me <laughs> off think, too. And you know, you see I it. Think it, that's it real life yeah. That that happened. Yep. And, and and it 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 plays out in different ways, you know. It, it's still even to this day in in Boston, you know, there are just Boston is fertile with incredibly talented women. I mean, really pillars of the music scene, you know, who don't get played on the radio and who don't get, you know, the shows they should be getting. You know, just um, they're supported within the community and have been, you know, some of them for decades, but it was sort of, I think because alternative rock, the focus sort of, the focus on Boston became about that, that narrow window. Mm -hmm. Those were the women that became more globally recognized, but like our, our city is just full of female musicians, singers, songwriters, of every genre who are killing it every day. You said that you were able to uh, keep kind of your little like Newport bubble. Mm -hmm. um, So it doesn't sound like your experience was as painful as um, some other people that I've talked to. Um, But just like, what was your experience being on a major label versus uh, like 4AD or a smaller? I am not a fan of the model. I'm going to say that I'm going to pre preemptive preempt what I'm about to say with the major label model was broken and um, that being said some of the people that we worked with at Reprise and Sire and Warner Brothers were some of the smartest most competent people um that I've ever worked with. It was different than 4AD also, so I can say all those same nice things about 4AD. 4AD definitely it was more of a family because that, for, um, Ivo Watts Russell just set up this, you know, kind of, his vibe was so tribal that I think we all, like, the bands all hung out together. We would mm-hmm. follow each other on tour, which is crazy. Like, who does that? Like, the Compto Twins came on tour with us. They weren't playing. Robin well. and Elizabeth just came on the Pixies and Muses tour to hang out. <laughs> and, like, you know, things like that. Like, I would just go over and just get on Wolfgang Press's bus for a few days. Like, we were just all close, genuinely, um, hanging out. Uh, and it is, we were in the off, like if some, if, if we were over there playing, people would meet us at the office there and we would just, you know, including the staff and the art department and everyone was just so, so tight and, um, working through a lot of stuff together, (laughs) um, for better or for worse, it got a little too tight sometimes. Um, but then Warner Brothers had a much more definitely clearly corporate structural but they they also had at the time I think they just very wisely assigned to us the people that clicked with us 
Um, and so we became very close to, in particular, I'm going to say the PR department, um, Deb Bernardini, who actually lives out here oh. now. Um, she co-manages Wilco and she's doing the festival this weekend. Oh, no kidding. She's one of the most, just the highest level of integrity and love of music and competent, insane, just a, we just can't, we, the people that were assigned to us for whatever reason just knew, just knew what they were doing and were in it for all the right reasons. And, mm. you know, the higher up you get, the less that is the case, um, you know? And yeah. then I think that probably some of those people's in, you know, when they, at their entry level had the same spirit, but, you know, again, again, just conversation similar to the one that I was just talking about, about how to market this and how to, you know, and just the broadest strokes imaginable yeah. in terms of how to deal with artists, um, which, you know, it did get to the point where I was just like, I'm not going to talk to those people. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to, you know, deal on the level I'm comfortable with and let my manager, our manager do the, yeah, yeah, take it's the ugly meetings. <laughs> yeah. Um, and this is a really boring question, but it's just like one that I always ask because I want to know how, <laughs> how did you make money? I know I'm throwing these is you never, you guys like never make money. Kristen talks about it. It was, yeah. I read, like, it was not. And it's just, it's so strange. Um, especially, me, like, being a young person, right? So, like, mm -hmm. me, I'm 13, and I see, I'm like, see you guys in reading magazines, and, you know, half the people in bands that I really like were not able to support themselves yeah. playing in those bands. Right. Um, so, like, what did you do to supplement your income and, su and survive while you were in throwing muses? And then were you able to make a living, like, in belly? Yeah. In throwing muses, I worked as a waitress for, for, you know, in the off time. Or I worked at Newberry Comics for years. Um, uh, and, then, and then just started kind of touring a lot. You know, once we signed with Warner Brothers, things did get easier we were still working <laughs> um oh, okay. but we had like tour support so then when we were on the road we were supported and so we did a lot of touring mm -hmm. um as a result with belly once belly happened that was that signing re-signing was significant um because it was on the heels of Star, mm -hmm. we signed after after the record had already taken off. Oh, okay. It was my was when my contract came up, and then I resigned at that point. So that was a fortuitous moment. But again, touring was if you wanted to to really be making a living, you had to tour all the time. You know, there was an 18 month tour at one point when I was in Delhi, um, just to make sure that we were in the black at the end of it, you know? Um, so I wasn't working at that point other than the music. And that kind of extended a little into my solo life. And then it, then it became, got to the point where I had, you know, mm -hmm. um, I became a doula at that point, which, and you know, my husband's a teacher, he teaches. You were a doula? I, I, yes, I've been, a, I was a doula. I actually <laughs> still what? am a doula. I do it, um, what? now I do it on a sort of SOS basis. Like if yeah. I have a, the woman that mentored me, if she's like, I can't do this this week, da, 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 then I'll go, I'll go in or whatever. But wow, I had yeah. no idea. <laughs> and I interviewed another doula or I you're sure kidding she calls herself uh bibby hansen oh yeah yeah uh, yeah 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 i was there yeah. and she was like on a skype yeah. call with 
Live at someone. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> something. Um, yeah, that's so. <laughs> yeah, that's so strange. I just I had no idea. I do. Oh, it's. I've I've done some birth work, but mostly I do postpartum. Yeah. Situation. So. Um, but it, it it's we just sort of I also I mean. I'm very Yankee, so so money's a funny. <laughs> Conversation, but I've also ever since I was a kid, I've just been a crazy hoarder mm. and very stingy, <laughs> frankly, and very saving. Like I had a savings yeah. account when I was ten, you know, <laughs> just a crazy person. Like um, I still don't have like, one. <laughs> <you're> a, <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, I think I'm getting it. I, well, it's well, it's <laughs> funny. Like we were like food stamps and well welfare, and I'm like putting oh my god, that's really, the like sent my grandparents like birthday money into this again like, yeah crazy, like a, you know i got a, i lied when i was 14 said i was 16 so i could start working rest the second i could i've just always yeah been very careful so that i tend makes a lot to of make sense. things last a very long time yeah the money question he's <laughs> asking about money i'm just like, i don't know why <laughs> like i just want to know <laughs> Some of these questions, yeah, I just get I just get to ask things that just like I want to know. They yeah, yeah. Really, right. Other people yeah, are like, yeah. why are you? No, but, not, but I think that that's a valid conversation, though. Yeah. Especially because, I mean, especially for younger people, like, what is this going to look like for me? You it's know, look like a, a lifetime. Of yeah. Not of just working really yes. hard and not making much money. Yeah. Well, I mean, the yep. record industry yep. doesn't even exist today. Like. We're yeah. talking about the 90s when it was right, still, right, right. Um, you know, yeah. a functioning entity. But now it's like, you yeah. just kind of give things away. I know. And hope people will yeah. pay for it. Yep. <laughs> I mean, so it's I totally do different. Think, yeah, I know, I know. I mean, it's such a double-edged sword because, I hate that phrase. <laughs> because I we do I feel out. like, um, <laughs> put something smarter in there. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, on the one hand, I think that, people have a much more of a chance of getting the DIY exposure that wasn't possible. Mm -hmm. You know, we really, really relied on the college radio network, Yeah. you know, and there was such a thing back then. Like they were all, you know, there was a real, that was the web yeah. in back then. Um, and if you didn't have that, those little dots lining up and those lights going off, then that was, you know, it was, it was playing, getting a good opening slot, getting college radio, you know, and now I feel like there's more potential to be heard. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the, unfortunately that potential to be heard involves a lot of exploitation and not being paid for your work and because it's work, you know, I mean, you can have the argument that, you know, what Susan intellectual property worth? like, I hate that argument because, and you know, actually Kristen and I have argued on this point because mm -hmm. I feel like, yes, it's, it's art and it's this nebulous thing you could argue belongs to everyone. But when you are working, you are working and you know, Whereas she, you know, like, I feel like, of course, people should, I think she feels, I, I, I feel it too. You know what? I, there is a, there is a, you do feel guilty saying, can you pay me for this song? There is like a yeah, feeling yeah. of just yuckiness to, to that. Because ideally it would be lovely if, you know, the arts were supported, <laughs> supported and, and then everyone could just feel good about it. Yeah. Um, but Patronage doesn't bum me out either, you know, to a certain extent, you know. Um, I do feel like that's a, an exchange that everybody feels good about. I insist on paying for mm -hmm. music. I insist on, you know, I don't even like being on the guest list and I'm not trying to sound like some kind of, yeah. you know. I just feel like that's fair. Like someone worked on this. It's work. You know, because mm -hmm. you left the Roy Muses and you left the Breeders to mm -hmm. start Belly 
And I'm assuming it's, you know, it's because you said you had all these songs and you wanted to, like, do something. But um, I'd also read in interviews that they just, like, it wasn't, they weren't very, like, pleasant <laughs> experiences. And so why did you leave um, both of those bands? Yeah, I guess the why. Yeah. Um, the Thorn Music situation could not have been a friendlier. <laughs> just sort of, that was more sort of about space space sharing and I was writing more and uh, you know uh, the, the dyna you know the, the the song space on those albums had been established and she's just Chris is just much more prolific than I am as a writer and so there was I, I, I didn't even it never got to the point where I even said I want more space on the albums yeah I knew that was not a question you know, that, that was not the, the situation. And so, for, you know, at that point I had already started with the breeders and our kind of arrangement, it was, it wasn't an arrangement. It was just sort of, Kim was like, I'll take the first album and you take the second. And that's what mm -hmm. the breeders will, will be, you know, our side project. Um, and again, that's when it, you know, at that point, I was more wanting to commit to something else full time, and Kim, it was still a side project for her at that point. And this is like a year only that this, you know. Yeah. Um, so, so I didn't really, like, there was no real breakup with the breeders. It was more just sort of this logistical decision, you know, just, um, there was one night where it got a little, you know, we were in Dayton and and she was kind of bummed with me and um, kind of understandably, you know, I felt like at the time, like, this is perfectly reasonable. I'm taking this song someplace else because I want to do them now. And she was sort of just saying, give me a few months and we'll do it. Like, I'm mm -hmm. going on tour, but I'm not leaving the bit, you know. And, and I just, for, for whatever reason, I had this real just sense of time moving too quickly for me and I wanted to get it done. I had these songs I needed and so I just said, I'm gonna, you know, I'll do your stuff in the Breeders' Context and so we did Safari, the EP after that, after I had already started Belly. Um, and then Kim left the Pixies and wanted to do that full time. We were both in our full time bubble. So it, that one sort of more was a series of segues and not so much me saying I'm leaving. Mm -hmm. the, the band oh, okay. um the muses was a declaration that was definitely it. yeah i read that you just burst yeah. into tears i did yeah yeah we just i did i did um because i was like leaving home that mm -hmm. one you know <clears throat> and that was with the understanding that like Kristen would continue the muses no actually and the, it, for for a short amount of time i wondered if that was ever weird no she like, actually mm -hmm. said well then we're just going to disband Mm -hmm. I think, and it was always going to be Kristen and David playing together, but they were going to rename themselves and be a new thing because mm -hmm. Fred came with me. Um, and so, but then they decided, because that would have been foolish. It would have been, you know, starting over. Yeah. And, and uh, happily they did not make that decision. So, um, but yeah, that was a big announcement, and that was really sad. And the, it, there was a lot of crying over that next year because we still finished the album and toured the album, and the last music show was really sad for me, really mm -hmm. hard. And you know, of course, on that night, I'm like, what am I doing? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Because interestingly, that ended up being the album that sort of did the best <laughs> to yeah. that point. So... Real Ramona? Yeah. Okay. So I don't remember what like, year, though. <laughs> am I really going to leave the band now? Yeah. Like, this is, what a weird decision to be making. Mm -hmm. um, but, it, you know, it ended up being best for for everyone. Because so. mm -hmm. you left Throwing Muses and you left the Breeders to mm -hmm. start Belly. And I'm assuming it's, you know, it's because you said you had all these songs and you wanted to, like, do something. But, um... I'd also read in interviews that they just, like, it wasn't, 
they weren't very like pleasant <laughs> experiences. And so why did you leave um, both of those bands? Yeah, I guess the why. Yeah. Um, the throwing music situation could not have been a friendlier. <laughs> Just sort of, that was more sort of about space space sharing and I was writing more and uh, you know it had the, the dyna- you know the, the the song space on those albums had been established and she's just Chris is just much more prolific than I am as a writer and so there was I, I, I didn't even it never got to the point where I even said I want more space on the albums yeah. like, I knew that was not a question you know that that was not the the situation and so for you know at that point i had already started with the breeders and our kind of arrangement it was it wasn't an arrangement it was just sort of kim was like i'll take the first album and you take the second and that's what mm-hmm. the breeders will will be you know our side project um and again that's when it you know at that point, I was more wanting to commit to something else full time, and Kim, it was still a side project for her at that point. And this is like a year only that this, you know. Yeah. Um, so, so I didn't really like. There was no real breakup with the breeders. It was more just sort of this logistical decision, you know. Just um, there was one night where it got a little, you know. We were in Dayton, and and she was kind of bummed with me, and um, kind of understandably, you know, I felt like at the time, like, this is perfectly reasonable. I'm taking the song someplace else because I want to do them now, and she was sort of just saying, give me a few months, and we'll do it. Like, I'm mm-hmm. going on tour, but I'm not leaving the bit, you know, and, and I just, for, for whatever reason, I had this real just sense of time moving too quickly for me and I wanted to get it done. I had these songs I needed and so I just said, I'm going to, you know, I'll do your stuff in the Breeders' Context and so we did Safari, the EP after that, after I had already started Belly. Um, And then Kim left the Pixies and wanted to do that full-time. We were both in our full-time bubble. So that one sort of more was a series of segues and not so much me saying I'm leaving Mm -hmm. the, the band. Oh, okay. Um, the Muses was a declaration. That was definitely it. Yeah, I read that you just burst yeah. into tears. I did. Yeah, yeah. We just, I did, I did. Um, because I was like leaving home that mm-hmm. one, you know. <clears throat> and that was with the understanding that like Kristen would continue the Muses. No, it actually, and the, it, for for a short amount of time. I wondered if that was ever weird. No, she like, actually said, "Well, then we're just going to disband." Mm-hmm. I think, and it was always going to be Kristen and David playing together, but they were going to rename themselves and be a new thing, because mm-hmm. Fred came with me, um, and so, but then they decided, because that would have been foolish, it would have been, you know. Starting over. Yeah, and and uh, happily they did not make that decision, so, um but yeah, that was a big announcement, and that was really sad. And the, it, there was a lot of crying over that next year because we still finished the album and toured the album, and the last music show was really sad for me, really yeah. hard. And you know, of course, on that night, I'm like, what am I doing? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Cause because interestingly, that ended up being the album that sort of did the best <laughs> yeah. to that point. So... Real Ramona? Yeah. Okay. So I don't sort of like, year, though. <laughs> am I really going to leave the band now? Yeah. Like, this is, what a weird decision to be making. Um, mm-hmm. But, it, you know, it ended up being best for for everyone. So. Um, and you had mentioned earlier uh, Belly's breaking up or disbanding. I can't remember what you said. But it sounded, it didn't sound like good. Mm-mm. But I was always wondering why you No, didn't... that was not good. Oh, okay. No, yeah. I mean, I really didn't know that either. Yeah. I just, I always wondered why you only recorded two albums and... The, um, I, I just think we were really, uh, 
it was a combination of things. I was, I abandoned the helm. <laughs> um, and there were just a lot of, I mean, by the end of it, there were factions not speaking and hadn't spoken oh. for an entire tour to, to each other. Um, that has since been, that is, it's just so behind us now. And, um, luckily we've all moved well beyond it. Um, it, it, it's that band started with such passion and love and like, we were just crazy about each other and had so much fun and, you know, and then it just sort of everything. I think we just let too to We panicked about how we were going to sustain it. I think mm. that's that's how, that's how it feels to me now. That that's what happened. That we felt this obligation to sustain this this level and move. You know, keep things moving forward. And then that. And then you know rather than what we should have done is sequester ourselves and just be like, okay, we're going to write a bunch of songs together and no one else is going to have anything to do with that. And we did to a certain extent, but then it was sort of, how are we going to keep, you know, the second album was very much like, how are we going to keep this going? And when it didn't keep going, um, it just, I think we just all started to feel like there was some, crack in the foundation that we kind of made up <laughs> mm-hmm. um, there were cracks but not nothing that we couldn't have mended if we had had the energy yeah I mean again we had the, you know it was an 18 month tour no one there was you know a lot of anger and just it, we just couldn't figure out a way to approach each other about that. I mean, we should, you know, you know, people make fun of Metallica for having a mediator <laughs> come on tour oh. with them. I mean, but honestly, I'm like, that, in the right hands, that it could have been everything, you know, that's, Dean, my husband always says, like, bands need doulas. <laughs> bands yeah. need, like, like, someone to come in and just facilitate and, you know, I mean, it doesn't seem like when you said tour for eighteen months, it doesn't seem like anything, any kind of working environment could be sustainable. Just like yeah, when people talk about how you know record companies functioned back then and how much you had to work with no real breaks in between, or I mean, eighteen months yeah. of touring is like. Yeah, wow. we we would have a week here. <laughs> we would yeah, like we'd have like a week between Europe and the U.S. Yeah, but or between the you know the tertiary mm-hmm. tour and the secondary market and like whatever like you know we'd have like, but you know it was just too it was too much and and we were all so with the exception of Gail, probably all drinking too much and um. That doesn't help. Yeah, see, that's a part of, like, so many um, bands' stories, too, Mm -hmm. or people that I've interviewed so far, but it's like, I didn't know that Yeah. about Belly. My perspective on things at that time was so skewed because I had had, towards the end, not at the end of Throwing Muses, but there was, like, a year in, within Throwing Muses that I had a pretty significant cocaine issue, Mm -hmm. and... Once I dealt with that, and then being in a world where heroin was so commonly used, my perspective on substance abuse was v- skewed far off. I mean, and my calibration was terrible. So drinking a lot seemed like, you know? Yeah. Yeah, of course I'm drinking several glasses of wine heroin. a night. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I used to be a coke addict. Yeah, so this yeah. is great. You know, like... Um, much better. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
<laughs> you know, just like the perspective is so yeah. whacked um, that it didn't, never for a second did I think that my perception or my ability to cope with difficult re- relationships or personality issues was being affected by alcohol consumption. Yeah. Um, and that seems crazy to me now. I mean, I'm not, I'm straight edge now, but, um, you know, I'm, I, <laughs> it's I'm, 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 I'm fine. I'm not straight edge. But I'm not like, you know, <laughs> like drink, drinking every day. I'm not drinking all the, you know what yeah. I mean? Like it's a, it's completely, and actually, yeah, it's, I, I mean, it just was very situational though. It's like backstage, we do it. And it's another thing. It's like when I'm home, I'm not. So that's why I must be, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's just like you've, everything was, it sounds like I'm doing that now. Like, it's only on the weekends every once in a while. But um, it's, it, it, it would never have occurred to me because of that crazy, because of just the pervasiveness of it, that that would have any impact on how my decision making, yeah. which is just to me now, like, it, yeah, it doesn't help. <laughs> no, no, I know, and there's ab- there's absolutely zero chance that it didn't impact on, yeah, on on how we chose to. To to navigate that band, so, I mean, Gail must have just been like, because <laughs> she's been straight edge her whole I know. life, I was her like, entire life, never had a drink. I always preface this in interviews <laughs> by saying that. I used to be very hesitant to ask certain kinds of questions because they're like kind of gendered questions. And now I just ask kind of like whatever I want or have always been curious about because I realize that like rock history and rock stories don't, um, (laughs) they don't involve like motherhood or Mm. there are things that are specific to, uh, um, woman's life that it's like you are a mom but you're also a musician yeah why does you being like you being a mom or a wife like why is that not part of the rock narrative or something and I I just think like talking about it will just make it part of it like with you know with Kristen when I was interviewing Kristen it's like yeah she's mom like tours with her kids like that's part of Um, the story mm -hmm. but just um so you did uh, throwing muses, breeders, belly. I was just wondering, like, during, um, pretty much during that time, like, being a touring musician who's working a lot, was it, did you always, like, want to have children? Now you've been with your husband for a long time. Is it something that... Um, I hadn't actually always wanted to have kids. And oh, in no. fact, I think there are a couple of interviews where I'm really rubbing up against the biological imperative to do so. Yeah, yeah, it was just sort of something... Dean and I just... You know, we just... It was almost an impulsive decision, in a a way, to do do it. Um, It's very hard for me to know, to be honest with you, and this is where I am most at sea... I don't know how it ha- it had, I know how it impacted me logistically and I have obviously written songs about my children or you know directly to them or you know in some way how they um have woven in um but it's hard to know artistically what that you know when I think about my songwriting and you know aside from the this song's about Gracie, or I said, you know, this one's directed to Harriet. Like, there's no, I can't really say musically how it impacts. It's very, like, I, I don't know how to tease that out. Um, um, logistically, they came on tour, you know, Gracie toured up until she, you know, I don't homeschool my kids, so they don't come on the, they don't, once they were in school, they were in school, and we, Dean and I kind of took turns touring, unless we were touring together, and then we would figure that out. Um, but they just sort of, 
just came on board, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's it's harder, absolutely, um, for, mul- for the, definitely in terms of who's going to take care of them while I'm actually on the stage and who's going to do, you know, who's, who's you know, working out who's going to do what for them just as living beings that need caring for. Mm-hmm. Um it, it's my the division of my attention is the hardest part part I think um because I just am always a little bit like this yeah. with them you know when they're with me I prefer to have them with me at all times on when we go on tour um but it definitely is um it's a real split mm. split for me um I know less so with Kristen. She doesn't feel that same. Like she, she has a more a, like more of a holistic way of touring with them, um, and probably uh, objectively, anyone would feel like we looked the same in the way. It's all internal with me about where my attention is going, and how and my um, my energy and. Um, watching myself a little bit more when they're around in terms of, you know, because especially with belly, there's a high level of irreverence, <laughs> irreverent humor. Yeah. Um, and they get that a little bit with, you know, because they, they, they get me. They know who I am. I'm not concealing. Um, but there have been a couple of times when they're both, I see them. <laughs> Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Oh. I mean, just because there will be some old story that comes up. Because um, I'm not dying to tell them everything. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so something will come up and or some joke will be made or, you know, something. And there's there there will be a moment where I have the same inner dialogue every time. Like, oh, God, I wish that that hadn't been... Witnessed, and then I immediately go to, well, I mean, I want them to know me. Hmm. So, but, but that's what I mean, like that. Your, about, I mean, uh, they, they know, do they like know all of your bands and your yeah, previous yeah. bands? I mean, you still. Yeah, and, and they, and they know all the people because they're still yeah. well, I'm in communication with everybody. So yeah, they know all of that. Um, do they and think there's it's a, cool or... Are they, they like embarrassed or? <laughs> they're not embarrassed. Oh, that's good. Um, okay. And they do like the music a lot. And actually, you know, Gracie's at the age where just like lyrically, she's very interested in what I'm. Oh. You know, she wants yeah. she, she. It's nice because she does really sort of dive into the songs in a way she didn't when she was, you know. So that's nice. Mm-hmm. Um, the little one, I think, thinks. She she, <laughs> Gracie loved touring. Loved it. Everything yeah. about it. She loved being backstage. She loved standing side stage. She loved the people. She loved the environment. She's always been more comfortable with adults. Yet when she you know has just always been that kid. Hattie's a little bit more. You know, you c- I come off stage and she's like, <sighs> like just <laughs> she's done. You know, she 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 gets into it to a certain extent, but she's not into the. Yeah, um, but she likes the music too, and you know, there's a real, like for whatever reason, the '90s resurgence that's happening with young younger people, or you know, it's because we're antique now, and that's always interesting for yeah, the they young. They call it soft grunge now, <laughs> and it's like a it's a sti- like a that right? style of clothing too. It's really, it's kind oh. of horrifying. Yeah. <laughs> what is that? What What does that include? Soft grunge. Yeah. Um, what does that mean? It's basically. So I've seen uh, like Tumblr pages, and because someone told me about this, so then I like, yeah. go online. I was like, "This is a thing now." So it's Nirvana T-shirts, you know, flannels, oh, but it's like right. expen. It's the whole look. You know, probably I don't know. Are Chuck's like grunge? What's a grunge shoe? Like, Chuck's have never just, have always just been a just staple, kind of whatever. Though. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, mostly like flannel and stuff is back, just like yeah, big yeah. baggy nineties right. music, and then even like the younger bands that are coming up now. 
it's really funny because I'll be like, oh my god, this sounds just like <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh and I can like, hear the, the, yeah, yeah, they yeah. are. Yep. I'm like, how do you not know? Yeah. <laughs> yep. That's so funny. Yeah. yeah. Thus, all of these yeah. interviews. <laughs> and they well, and they are. Yeah. It's that's so great. I mean, Gracie's friends are now aware, which is kind of interesting, you yeah. know, because it's always interesting to hear too, just how things get distilled through time and. And grouped and regrouped and how people think about the past, what's the past, yeah. you know? It just sort of is interesting to see, like, these these sort of frag things that I, music that I feel like the fractions couldn't be more polar have now become mm. the 90s. Yeah. Or, you know, the yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> Like what women in Iraq was yes. in the 90s, now it's like the, the 90s. Yeah, exactly. All yeah. of us in Here one little package. <laughs> oh, I think this is like put my hand in front of that. <laughs> well, okay, we can cut that out. Um, oh, crap. I was like going to seamlessly go into, into something else and I forget. Well, because this has been all over the place. It's great. Oh, yeah, I'm yeah. always so I, curious I, about how they're going to like turn out or right. in what which order we will talk about things. Oh, I do remember, because you said something about your daughter, Gracie, Mm -hmm. being really interested in your lyrics. Mm -hmm. And so, I, too, have always really loved your lyrics. Um, And so this kind of also goes in, like, listening to your um, stuff from the Swan Song series and your Mm -hmm. solo stuff, it seems more, uh, more straightforward, or like storytelling mm. a little bit um and then your belly lyrics i mean especially when i was younger i was just like the more cryptic the better like yeah me too um yeah yeah i was just well clearly <laughs> yeah <laughs> um but like yeah so how you used to approach lyrics as okay i'm gonna rephrase this because it's gonna be a couple different questions were your lyrics in belly intentionally kind of cryptic and weird and like because you're a private person in order to not just kind of say stuff. yeah yes that De- there there I was absolutely trying to throw a gauze veil over some subjects while still indulging myself by singing about them mm-hmm. um so yeah there is some it's I wouldn't say it's yes there is an element of protecting some of the people that I, you know, pr- protecting myself, protecting some people that I was singing about. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also, at the time, was, you know, feeling like um, there should be some poetry involved in lyrics. And I wanted, and I didn't, I, I, I had come, I was coming from a place of, if you're just going to say it, what's the point? Then I might as well just be talking, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um which, you know, I can still ascribe to a tiny bit, but I do still feel like obviously mm-hmm. some very explicit right out there lyrics are very beautiful when they're sung, you know. Um, so I did, I you know, I, I wasn't crafting anything to be potentially obscure, but I wasn't avoiding it either. And, mm-hmm. um, and also, you know, there's a, an element to coming straight, coming out of the muses and filtered through the breeders. Those songs yeah. also were affected very much by those women, those two very strong women. Um, and so there's, which I'm not, you know, I'm, I feel I'm happy to be affected by. by that. Oh, yeah, they're lyrics. Yeah. Like, right. Oh God. Um, so there's a piece of that, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, like, how do you, do you approach lyric writing or just writing in general differently now? Was it, like, a natural progression or is it just you're older now and you don't... It was a a natural, uh, both, again, both. Um, I, I feel like, you know, I think it's, like, kind of the difference between poetry and prose in a way. Like, um... Poetry is is dense and compact and sometimes representative of, you know, and then prose is like, here's the story, 
you know, and beautifully, you know, mm -hmm. there's still the perfect yeah. sentences within great litter, you know, um, but it was, it, it, I did get to the point where I was feeling like I'm not going to avoid telling, telling a clear story because that's self-defeating and that's not what the song wants to do. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so yeah, but it did, and it did happen naturally. It did sort of just happen with swan, and also another thing, especially with swan songs is... I started really understanding that I love collaborating and that's where my greatest strengths are is in um, co-writing quite simply but also even just to the point of allowing other people's mus musical and contributions to affect where the song goes even lyrically um, mm. and so that that you know just there are so many people my solo albums involve so many, so much collaboration that I feel like those were bands too, in a way. Um, so, I mean, it really does, the person I'm writing with impacts what I say. The, the book I just read, the conversation I just had, the experience I just, you know, so it, it's, um, if it's a story about me, I do just tend to sort of mm. be like, I, and, and a lot of them are letters to people too. You know, there's a lot of that. Like, you know, like here's the uh, thing I need to say to you. <laughs> or yeah, a little bit. Um, I mean, like your most recent. Yeah. Story? Yeah, most. Anything. All the solos. A lot of the right, solos. Just what's Low yeah. Red Moon about? Low Red Moon is about. <laughs> <laughs> it's that's, about a relationship. It's, that's one of my favorite belly songs ever, and I realize I always like like the weird song on an album. I don't know. I noticed that about myself. Like, the one that's just kind of... Yeah. I feel like it's just sort of tucked in there. That was actually about of someone who I ended up being in a relationship with, but that was written at a point when I thought it wasn't going to happen. And it was about sort of... Oh. Um, how that was going to be a lifelong sadness, but something that was going to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> if it didn't have you know it's just sort of like how we carry the the events that don't happen with us mm. or the things that don't happen the connections that aren't made it's also very fitting it's weird that that's my song hmm. <laughs> is it? yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, no it's fine well I mean we all right. I mean there are so yeah. many people on our huh. people in our in our lives who aren't in our lives you know Who's, who's, whose presence, and it can even be something very brief that just this person just stays with you for the rest of your whole life. Mm -hmm. And I have so many living ghosts like that, you know. I would never so. have guessed that out of those lyrics. Right. I feel like I get less creative as I get older. <laughs> <laughs> the more no. I interview, I'm just like, I am... Sometimes I think I'm, like, a little cool and interesting, and then I'm just like, oh, no. No, you <laughs> Well, again, though, that I cloaked it. You know, that one is very cloaked because it involved other a lot of other people, and it was a letter to somebody that I had to be really careful with. And I didn't, again, it's, like, such a funny thing because it sounds like I'm, it sounds like I have a very sort of a plain song, and then I turn it into a complicated one. To, it's <laughs> not like that. You know, I'm not that good a chef <laughs> yeah. um I just um but it was one that one is one where I was definitely trying to say something clear <laughs> and the person who it's about can hear that yeah you know oh okay <laughs> <laughs> that's smart so you were in that car accident with your mother mm -hmm. when you were 12 um, but the part I wanted to ask you about was, um, you described it as being a pivotal, a pivotal spiritual moment in your life. Mm. Um, and there's a quote, I can't see, I like don't reference anything, so I don't know who to <laughs> give credit to, but this is, I love this quote. 
You said people think it's embarrassing to talk about God, but we'll talk about puking after a show and not be embarrassed at all. <laughs> yeah. So, like, I didn't realize that you were a very spiritual person at all. Mm-hmm. I, it was funny because reading this interview, you, like, use the word God, which I'm also, I mean, especially now, I'm, like, not used to seeing it. Yeah. And I was like, you know. I'm surprised I used that word, too. Like, yeah. Yeah. I'm surprised I used that word, too, because, I, you know, that it's, it's a, there's no language around it that doesn't, that isn't loaded, mm-hmm. though, you know? So, I have a very, you know, I do have a belief system that's relatively strong, but it's also very specific. Like, it's like a coat of many colors. Yeah. (laughs) You know, I kind of, it's homespun. Like, it's, I pulled from a lot of wisdom, world wisdoms. It's um, not something that I feel... You know, it's so intan- it's clearly intangible. Um, there's no dogma around it. There's no, you know, so it's just this thing that exists within me. And I do talk, my kids and my husband know, because my kids especially are just, in, you know, they mm-hmm. want to know, like, what do we believe? They will say, both of them individually, oh. seven years apart, have said, what do we believe? <laughs> you know, as if. Because they, you know, they, there's, there are people, they look at people who come from households with a belief system, very, an established system that includes other people and includes communities, and we don't have that, but they know that I um, believe, mm-hmm. and so they, <laughs> they want to know, and so then I, you know, I'll answer, I'm like, you have to, this is a question by question basis I'll say you know ask me a question and I'll answer but I can't just say to you it's not that simple for me you know I can't yeah. say you know these are my gods and goddesses this is my these are my prophets it's not like that for me you know mm-hmm. um what happened but it's, it's the... funny that I said that because it is it, it's not something that I feel drawn to to discuss and in fact the older I get the less you know I feel like um like I need to verbally plumb those depths like that's something that I just am have come to a point where I'm like you know even with Dave you know he'll say what do you you know well, what about it you know, do you think about it? and I'm just like who cares <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You really care, <laughs> like, like in a, in a in a way. And he's fully agnostic. His whole his whole viewpoint is, you know, he's he said to one of the kids once. I can't remember which one, but he was like, "God is none of our business" or something. <laughs> like just basically, yeah. you know, he's so, you know, we'll we'll see. You know, he's very much a humanist, and we both are. We live, you know, if we were going to be pushed, we would say we are humanists, you know, and that's, um, how we live. We don't live any other way, but I know it's, it's complicated. Yeah. 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 Um, well, but I was, I was also wondering what, was it like the accident itself or did something happen? Like what was that moment? Um, it was the, it was the accident. I mean, there's a little bit of, um, a lot of things coming together at that point. My mom had been hanging out with this um, man who lived in a Hindu ashram, and he was very involved in a Boston movement around that at the time. And excuse me, sorry. Um, oh, it's okay. I I had like a you know a trance-like experience. It wasn't out of body. I didn't almost die. There's nothing. But, um, and part of it, I think, is just because I lost so much blood and and we had to be taken out with the jaws of life. And it was, I was, del- by the time the EMTs were taking me out of the car, I I was saying to them, don't, don't throw me away. Oh. Like, I thought they were just going to throw me over the bridge. It happened on a bridge because I was broken. And um, I was in this place where I had just separated myself from my body so completely just that, you know, I went into this trance, you know, this sort of trance, like, and I think it was just a shock, Mm -hmm. you know, 
it took a long time to get to the hospital. There was a lot, you know, um, looked like I was going to lose my leg. And I just kind of separated again, not out of nothing, you know, just really internally. Um, and it was so peaceful. Mm -hmm. Like it just felt weird to say, but you know, my dad says he came into the, by the time he got to the hospital, I turned around and I smiled at him and he said, he, I just, he was just like, what are you, like, you know, that was my reaction I just had in, because it just felt, I don't know, <laughs> amazing. Yeah. I know that's, you know, this is before they pumped drugs into me too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then, you know, I woke up and there was physical therapy and everything was so painful. And it was like a six hour operation. And I, I came out, I was just like, I want to get back to that, to that place. That, and I was 12, so I didn't even know how to pursue that independently, you know. And so my poor mother, I convinced her to let me go stay in this ashram. Mm. Um, once I was healed enough, when the cast was up. Um, and the original, you know, she's amazing because... She said, no, absolutely not. That's ridiculous. You're trying, you know, and then she was like, well, I'll go with you. And that was not what I was looking for. Um, she said, okay, you can go and you can spend a summer. And I lasted like a week and a half, I think. <laughs> um, because it wasn't what, you know, it was just, this isn't it. Yeah. And, you know, from that point on, I searched and I searched. And as an adult, I spent a lot of my life sort of sitting in on this, that, or the other service, and um, none of it was that thing. Yeah. Um, and that's only something, you know, it was really discovering the Transcendentalists and that movement in Concord in the 1800s, and, you know, the, that... Um, It's kind of what I, you know, the only time, place that I find that now is outside. Yeah. Um, so, or if I, you know, or, or you know, some trance-like moment that just happens spontaneously, you know. Mm. Uh, which yeah, you should probably move up here then. Yeah, I oh, believe me, we think about all that. the time, I, I think about, you know just the lack of and also just really um, more pragmatically raising my children in a place with limited beauty yeah. is you know I think about that okay I feel like people are going to hate me because <laughs> I feel like this has been more of um, more like personal oh than, yeah okay. I know because I didn't Cause ask I... you like about gear or oh, no, do you care what... about that I do, I do. You do? I do to a certain extent. Okay, because like, I, I don't, don't care, so I don't even like yeah. to ask people. I didn't care for a long time, and I kind of, it depended on what band I was in. Like, okay. it was very, um, you know, Vox for the Muses, <laughs> Marshalls huh. for Billy, like a little bit, kind of different. Um, uh, and I'm back to, I'm back to Vox, actually. Yeah. Um, now... Pedal wise, I've been pretty loyal to like, you know, reverb distortion that just real, just very simple. I've never had a pedal board. Yeah. I don't, you know, it's just, I'm very kind of utilitarian about that. It's just like, this part needs to be louder than the part that came before, and I need some reverb on this and some delay, and I need a, you know, the chorus is good for this song. It's all, I don't have like, any one sound or yeah. really any company even that I'm and is it like do you have um, an idea for a song in your head and then you kind of like experiment with equipment or pedals and amps to yeah match that yeah yeah okay yeah and yeah. this is another thing that I'm really curious about um, any knowledge that you have of like amps or which guitars you prefer or pedals to get the kind of reverb you want. Did you figure all that out on your own? Um, is that something you experimented with or was it from like other musicians that you've 
worked with and like asking questions I guess it's the same with the recording yeah. process like how kind of involved or knowledgeable are you about like the sound that you're I found out I most of it is trial and error yeah. um for uh, also the studios that I've worked in most consists consistently like Fort Apache and Q Division in yeah. Boston they have a ton of amps on bank they have a ton of pedals and so you can play a lot with that. Um, I've never, you know, interestingly, a friend of my friend, Russell Chudnovsky, who plays with my solo, he's part of my like solo live band, he was, you know, he'll, he'll say, you know, this is that Johnny Marr sound from blah, 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 and I figure, I reverse engineered it and figured it out, and I know what pedals it. It's never occurred to me to do that. Like, I will hear <laughs> something that I will fall in love with, and I will never explore how to replicate that mm-hmm. it's just not something that's in my yeah see though that's what i would consider a gearhead just yeah like, yeah I'm it but, out I, I'm, but I'm just like how <laughs> awesome that you did that yeah. <laughs> you know um yeah that's not i'm not yeah. i'm not like that i don't have a toolbox with my you know it's it's more sort of like song song by song band by band sound by you know like right now for instance playing with belly again tom has a vast array of sounds at his disposal so i tend to um sort of be more of the workhorse in that and just Mm -hmm. be sort of you know um which is fine because that was our our sound you know um whereas with the muses i had more much more like you know a pedal for the bridge of one song would be, do you know what I mean? Like, and that's all I'm going to use it for, but that's the thing that needs to happen in that part. So that was, that was my most gearish time, I think was in, in the muses when I was changing sounds a lot, song to song. Mm -hmm. And, um, it was funny because I, you know, I know some real super gearheads and we just had a, this all women's band that plays, this charity every year mm-hmm. um and in boston right yeah okay yep yeah, and they're all old old friends of mine we bought you know um and some real gearheads <laughs> just like <laughs> where to where practice i'm like yeah <laughs> they're like yeah. is everyone done checking out each other's stuff because now it's <laughs> now it's time to actually play songs <laughs> yeah um, but I love it. I mean, it's 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 interesting. I like observing, and I learned a lot. Learn a lot through listening to other people talk about their junk. But it's you know, Listen. it's a finite conversation for me. I'll yeah. put it that way. <laughs> um. All right. Which one should I do next? Okay, I think I'm going to ask this one next. I usually save it for last. But, um, just, you're someone who gets, like, referenced a lot in other interviews that I do. We were talking about Veruca Salt earlier, and, like, Louise Post, one of the first people that she mentioned was you. Oh. And, like, the B-52, she was just like, Tony Donnelly, like, when I oh, am Billy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you've been in, I mean, you're pretty much, like, I don't know, what would you call it? Indie rock or, like, rock royalty in indie rock? Not mainstream, but mm. you're, like, very important Been a lot in of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is weird because you're also so approachable. Like, that's one of the reasons I would not... I waited so long to contact you because I see you as this kind of, like, as up on a pedestal. Yeah. So it's exactly. really... So thank you for, like, being so oh. nice, too. It's really oh. <laughs> refreshing, but... How do you feel about your role in and your contribution to rock history? Um, and don't be humble. I'm not going to be. Okay, because, great. you know, I was just <laughs> going to say, for many years, I genuinely didn't feel that at all. I really didn't. Like, I felt, I looked into this, and then I looked into that, and then I, like, I, you know, I had this sort of feeling that I didn't really recognize my own... I'm going to use a word that people overuse, agency in those, you know, in those situations. Um, but now I think, you know, at 50, I can look back and, and I'm really pr- proud of my contribution on a, in a, in a, on so many levels. Um, 
I do still very much feel like there's a large amount of, you know, just being in the right place at the right time and meeting, you know, and connecting with the people I connected with. And, um, but you know, there, there's, it is a sort, I mean, I'm, I, I let myself feel good about that and proud of it now. And especially because, especially because of the stories like the one you just told me about Louise, like when I hear a story like that, it makes me feel a sense of purpose that, that maybe I didn't feel in the moment at that time, or, you know, that wasn't the focus at the time, but now I feel like that's, every, you know, especially when it comes to young women being inspired. Yeah. That's everything, you know. Um, so, yeah, that's very fulfilling to me. And, you know, it's a very, it's a nice sort of postscript gift. Mm-hmm. in a way when I hear and that happens a lot you know it does happen a lot that that people the women will say thank you to you know to uh, my pool not just specifically to me but just in general um reference us and that it's just there's no there aren't really words for how much that means mm-hmm. <laughs> there just aren't it, you know it's just really it just hits me on such a profoundly visceral level to hear, you know, it's almost a physical uprising of joy. <laughs> Gratitude. <laughs> like I just make it, I know, you know, to hear that is, is, uh, is huge. Yeah. So good. Well, yeah. it's true. I mean, there've been more, she's just, she's the person that I thought of, but I, whenever I do an interview, I make note of, I have like a list somewhere of, you know, just like, oh my God, this person Mm. referenced this person and like thanked me for interviewing this person. Well, I feel like that looking at your list, I was just like, you know, because that goes back, you know, it goes back to all of those women. Yeah. For me too, you know. Uh, Mm -hmm. Just how do you feel about the... So these are both kind of like women, like women in rock questions mm-hmm. a little bit. But how do you feel about the category, um, women in rock or women of rock? Um, is it more helpful or hurtful? Is it necessary or unnecessary? And would it be like more productive at this point in time to just leave it like not use it as a category? Um. I would clearly in some utopian sense prefer that it didn't weren't necessary for it to be a category but I do also recognize that necessity Mm -hmm. um and you know if framed a certain way there's a sisterhood element to it which is nice you know um I think there's a bond you know, the flip side of it, of being called women in rock or women in anything, there's always that distinction made, you know. Um, this The flip side to that is that there's also a, a shortcut to kind of a bond that happens quickly between women in rock, mm-hmm. um, for the most part, you know. Uh... I mean, without sounding uh, pessimistic, I feel like this is going to to continue this conversation. You know, this conversation. Yeah. You know, there was a time when I felt like that's it. We broke the ceiling, and now everything's going to be great. <laughs> and and um. And I don't feel that way anymore because I see the young female musicians going through the exact same, you know, backwards and high heels <laughs> issues, you know, that I've, that uh, that we did to a certain ex- extent. And you know, and and the irony being that when we started, I was coming out of you know 
households filled with women singing. You know, like my entire, the soundtrack of my life was female recording artists. So, you know, we were sort of surprised by by the fact in the 80s that there was yeah. anything to to continue to to discuss. And that's so naive. <laughs> and so I try not to bring that naivete into my older years and understand that this is... It's almost like um, discontinue to have the conversation, to fight the good fight, and not expect that there's going to be some one one day when that phrase is not going to be necessary anymore. So you know, I try to try to flip it on its head and say, yeah, women in rock. You know, that's. Yeah, I don't mind it. Yeah, I don't mind it either. And I also try uh, to uh, like call men. I'll say like male fronted band or like men in rock. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Men in rock. I don't know why right. not. Maybe yeah, yeah. If we're like all doing it, then. <laughs> right. Yeah. Then it'll become as commonplace yeah. as the other. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, I mean, there's. It's just you know we still there's still a wage gap. There's still you know. Oh no! Hiring there, no, there policy issues. Anymore. It's just. You know, it's, there's, it's fine. It's gone. Oh yeah. okay. Oh good. Yeah, oh hear. good. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's fine. Oh, that, that must have been while I was sleeping. Yeah, you just missed it. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's equal now. Oh, God. Yeah. Saw it on Fox. Okay. Check. <laughs> <laughs> Let's t- we'll check that one off. Yeah. Um, oh, but going off that, what are your thoughts on the visibility of women in rock history? Like, as, as a whole. Is there... A gender discrepancy still is it not really an issue? I think less so, and and you know I uh, I feel like within the world of musicians themselves, there's enough, there's so much cross referencing, you know, between the genders, you know, men being influenced by women and vice versa, and um, yeah, I almost feel like in the daily work a day sort of mechanism it's still a struggle struggle but in terms of getting people getting their props and recognition I think it's a little more Mm. I mean occasionally like here's where it's glaring like when you have somebody talking about music history somebody knowledgeable writing and you know there's 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 more equality whenever I see any list that's where it's glaringly devoid of women and it's almost like they're throwing in, like, oh, there's no girls on the list. We better, you know, you know. Um, yeah. That's just very old school, though. And, you know, I, I feel, I do genuinely feel like, like women are treated almost more equally and fairly in hindsight than they are in present. Oh, yeah. So... Wow. <laughs> you know what I mean, though? I mean, yeah. just in terms of, yeah, like, legacy. Yeah. That's depressing. <laughs> <laughs> we just end on that. <laughs> and cut. That's true, though. Um, oh, my God. Okay, we did that. I feel like now I don't have a good ending. I swear out every interview I Mm -hmm. I do, it ends on, like, the most depressing... During Tracy Bonham's, it was the best, because we just started talking about Trump, and then I just said, I wish I'm waiting for them all to die. (laughs) But she had just said something, like, really great, that I ruined it. That's awesome, though. Yeah. (laughs) And so I sent it it to her, and I was just like... I kept that on, and I was like, I'll take it out if you don't want it. Yeah, yeah. If you don't want it, but it's on there, so... Right. (laughs) Um... I mean, I just feel like there, I don't know, there's like so much to talk about. And I feel like, you know, it's like a few hours or something. Is there anything that, I mean, I want to leave, if there's something that you, that I 
didn't ask that you want to talk about or something that we talked about that we didn't really go into? Mm. I don't know. I don't think so. I think I over... I mean, I, I talked more than I usually you did do. Over-share. <laughs> yeah. It was I was great. Say, yeah. I'm a Gemini, so I'm I love talking to people and I'm just like, I'll tell you really personal information, then you tell me you really tell personal your stuff too. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's like we're sharing. So no, I mean Yeah. All of that was like great and unexpected. I'm glad that I you know, I've it's been on my the, the, the specifically in my city, the Boston women who who are overlooked outside of the city has been on my mind lately so I'm glad I got that in there at one point just in terms of um are you talking like are you talking just, about women who are who are still working and playing currently yeah yeah okay like, I know yep. Hilkin it's a, yeah Hilkin you know, yeah yep. I didn't realize that you she's one of one, one of my them, yeah yeah she's yeah. a good friend of mine um yeah, Talia Zedek. Do you know Talia? Yeah, who yeah. Is, I know. I have to interview her. Oh, you really do. Yeah, no, she's, she's on my list. Yeah. She's um, she's on my pantheon. Yeah, <laughs> like she's so important. Yeah. To, to Boston music, in general, but to women, mm-hmm. just her presence is huge, in that city. Um. And then they're like, they, you know, from all different genres, like Sarah Borges, who's, who is amazing, Andrea Gillis, Linda Vienz, there's just all these women that have just been there. Emily Grogan, they play all the time. Melissa Gibbs, I'm just going to keep them. going now. Yeah. No, I know <laughs> um, most of them, and I've yeah. lived in Boston for a while, so right. I remember. Like, just, mm-hmm. the musicianship's crazy, and the singing, and just like, so, you know, just so many examples of... And I use the word pillars, but it's true. Like, they're, you know, so instrumental in holding up the city, mm-hmm. the music scene. Um, on all ends of, of things, you know. So, anyway. You took, like, a pretty significant, I think the longest break you took, and I wrote it down, because <laughs> I'm, like, anal retentive. Um... 2007 to 2013, yeah. you didn't do anything. No, I didn't. Except you just were like parenting. You were yeah. Forming. Those were my doula. Those were the in- the intensive doula years too. I was working as a doula throughout. Okay. That most of that, and that's what I kind of wanted to um, focus on that work. Okay. So so I was doing a lot of training around that, and then working, and I really that was taking all of my energy other than parenting at that point. And also I just sort of fell into sort of this, I was still playing locally, like I'd still get guesting and opening for mm-hmm. friends and playing shows in Boston, and I but just became sort of very Boston focused. So I was still doing stuff in Boston. Um, but I wasn't releasing anything, and I wasn't recording, and I wasn't really writing even for a while there. Um, and then uh, my friend Wesley, Wes, Wesley Stace, uh, John Wesley Harding, he's, um, he does this like Cabinet of Wonders thing. It's like a oh. cabaret, <laughs> and it's writers and uh, musicians and comedians. Um, it's actually the show that Tracy and I did the day before oh, no she came. Yeah, um, and I did my first one. He invited me to do that, and he sort of, you know, I was like, I don't know, I'm not really playing. I'm just kind of playing with my friends in Boston, you know, which is guess really literally like getting up and singing like a couple of songs with people. <laughs> yeah. Was doing it for me for a long time, you know, um, and then he was just like, you know, you're prob- that you're sliding into. <laughs> Retirement, don't you? <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, am I? Is that what's happening? Um, and so I did like a, I did a couple of those shows, and at those shows, I met authors that I loved and other musicians, and I started to sort you know those end of the night conversations, which happen where everyone's like, we should do something to get. I started gracelessly following up on those and <laughs> and writing. That's where the swan songs came in and I kind of called it Swan Songs because I was like well if I am in fact retiring I'm going to d- 
do it on my own terms. Um, and then that just kept going and going and going. <laughs> um, and then belly reformed and, you know, I just, you know, got my ass out of the house again, basically, and started doing did you like miss it when you weren't doing it or when you were focusing on the I, stuff? Or? I, I missed it to a point, but again, like this huge piece of me that's happiest in the quiet <laughs> thrived in that mm-hmm. time. Um, and again, when I started jonesing, getting to where I wanted to do something, you know, I'd call one of my friends and be like, can I do a couple of songs at your show, you know, before you play or, or I'd get invited to guest on something or, and it would feed that enough that it carried me through from show to show yeah. that way. Um, I never had like a, like a, a despairing, um, like sort of mourning period for it though. It didn't get to that, to that point. Um, but I was happy when it, you know, I'm, I was happy to start writing again and again, you know, just to be, just to be writing more than anything, which is my favorite part. Um, felt great, you know, felt great and still does, you know, it's just, it is something that is so nourishing to me. Um, and so getting back into that you know, to the, into the discipline of that and, and, um, making sure I keep that muscle toned (laughs) has been, has been, you know, and, and I think it would have happened without, without Wes shaming me on state, onto the stage (laughs) again, onto his stage in particular. Yes. Yeah. 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 Sometimes, sometimes it just needs a friend (laughs) making fun of you. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. I can't. And then I just said shit. (laughs) Whisper. I know. I swore a whole lot. I I I know. I get. Um. Okay. Are you sure? Well, the good thing is that we can always do this again someday. Yeah. Sure. We have collections at Smith. Like you should. Glory Sam's got like forty hours of God. I would love. Loretta Ross, you can just like, I think it's super interesting because we can do this now and then in 10 years, like do another one and just see what's changed. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. So, but I just It's amazing. It's an amazing thing to do. And I, yeah. Now. I feel like it was a good interview. Yeah. It was great. Did you have a good time? I had a really good time. Great. And I also talked a lot. Which I know I no I was not I was expecting you to be maybe like a one word answer which, which course, is awful. And I'm going to give you I'm going to tell you right now you're going to get a follow up shame email or something of me saying I'm sorry Dr. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god okay well we're um, I think that was great so thank you I love this project it's so amazing Thanks. it 